Good evening and welcome to Business 7. My name is Philippus Useku, your host. Today, we'll be looking at the stability of the financial system, as well as the presentations at the recently concluded Energy Conference. And then, as usual, we'll bring you the top five stories that made headlines on the African continent. So stay tuned. Connection. It's in the human touch, the feeling of belonging. It inspires us and empowers us, creates clarity from complexity. It starts new conversations, unlocks the power of advice, and makes an impact on your life. At Alex Forbes, we pioneer insight to provide you with advice that connects your decisions of today to your impact tomorrow. Kicking off, let's look at the top five stories that made headlines on the African continent as provided by Reuters. Here are five stories making business headlines in sub-Saharan Africa this week. Violence in Sudan has raised question marks over supplies of gum arabic, a key ingredient in everything from fizzy drinks to cosmetics. Wary of Sudan's persistent insecurity, companies such as Coca-Cola and Pepsi have long stockpiled the gum, which comes from acacia trees in the Sahel. Exporters, suppliers and distributors said trade in the gum had ground to a halt, and some estimated that stockpiles will run out in up to six months. Sudan's conflict between the army and a paramilitary force has killed hundreds and triggered a humanitarian crisis. South Africa's ESCOM is losing well over 1 billion rand, or 55 million US dollars, a month from theft, former chief executive Andre de Reuter told Parliament on Wednesday. The state power company has struggled to supply enough electricity for more than a decade, with outages at the moment lasting around 10 hours a day for most households, the worst on record. Mozambique's president has said it is safe for Total Energies to restart a $20 billion LNG project in Cabo Delgado province that was halted in 2021 due to attacks by an Islamic State-linked insurgency on civilians. A spokesperson for Total Energies, which owns 26.5% of the project, said it was not their decision alone and that the decision to restart depends on assurances of security and human rights. An agreement on royalties between Congo's state miner and China's CMOC has been reached, Congo's finance minister said on Monday. That's paved the way for the resumption of exports from Tenke Fungarumu Mining, the world's second largest cobalt mine, which were suspended in July. And finally, Zimbabwean police are clamping down on backyard brewers, who make fake whiskey, brandy, vodka and other spirits. Civil society groups say alcohol and drug abuse is on the rise amid economic hardship in Zimbabwe, and that the illicit booze is contributing to the problem. Every day, you make choices that make you legendary. Journey together with us on the path to securing your legacy as a member of the League of Legends. With the Select Platinum Bundle Fee Premium Bank Offering, you will access tools that will enable you to thrive. If you earn $850,000 Namibian dollars per annum or more, you can apply for this offering today via bankventure.com.na for only $447 Namibian dollars per month. Bankventure, a member of Capricorn Group. The Bank of Namibia, as well as the uh, NAMFISA, recently released the financial stability report and found that the Namibian banking and non-banking sector remains sound, resilient and profitable. Let's have a look. You would recall that banks, uh, to the tough measures implemented, were able to withstand the storm, not underplaying the devastating impacts that the pandemic had on our economy and in our personal lives. What is important to note is that just as we were dusting ourselves off from the pandemic, beginning the hard work of economic recovery, the world has again been hit by a wave of inflationary pressures driven by significant increases in fuel and food prices. It is now well understood that the inflationary pressures experienced globally emanated primarily from significant supply disruptions and geopolitical tensions in Eastern Europe. So authorities all over the world 
responded to this new challenge boldly and swiftly. They took unpopular decisions uh, that may have unintended short-term consequences but could pay off in the long term. Back home in Namibia, we are not spared from the impact of this new wave of inflationary pressures, and rightly so for a small economy. Consequently, as a monetary policy authority, the bank also acted boldly and swiftly. We acted within our mandate, uh, using the necessary tools at our disposal to contain inflationary pressures and to maintain the one-to-one -one pack with the South African rand. We are well aware in the short term, we are well aware of the short term pain that this have on borrowers. But we are fully convinced that it's the right thing to do for our economy uh, in the long run. Allowing inflation to spin out of control can have far reaching consequences to our economy, particularly the recovery path, and can put our economy in a very vulnerable shape and space. In addition to the prevailing challenges, Related to inflationary pressures, we have recently witnessed banking system turmoil, which resulted in banking failures in the U.S. and Switzerland, posing a threat to global financial stability. Uh, while it's important to understand the different contexts between what is happening in those countries and our situation here at home, the bank failures will provide lessons for us. Uh, it will amplify the need to ensure our frameworks are enhanced, Yes, each bank has its own story, but globalization and interconnectedness between markets and institutions remind us that if not properly contained, these developments have the potential to disrupt the global financial system uh, and culminate into a crisis. It is, however, pleasing that authorities in those jurisdictions are doing all they can to contain the situation in the most effective manner to avoid such disruptions. The key lesson we take from these bank failures is that even in advanced economies with sophisticated supervisory uh, regimes, banking institutions can fail. What is important, therefore, is whether we have put in place appropriate measures to ensure that such fail failures do not culminate into systemic crisis. So here at home, we must ensure that effective bank resolution frameworks uh, are in place and do everything we can to strengthen the deposit guarantee scheme we have put in place. I painted the above picture not to relive the past, but to help us better understand the context that we are, are dealing with, as well as for us to deliberate on how to navigate the storms and emerge stronger than before. As you heard from the previous speaker, the key message from the report we are launching today uh, is that financial, the financial system remains stable amidst the prevailing risk. The ability of the system to weather the storm is to a large extent thanks to the actions we took earlier on through the strengthening of the capitalization of banks as well as the provision of relief measures. The relief measures that we have introduced both in the banking and non-banking space have enabled the soft landing and safeguarded the stability of the system. We are, however, aware that while the measures are put in place and it has helped the sector to stay afloat, the average consumer, particularly the small businesses, have not felt the impact of these relief measures yet. As such, the Bank of Namibia is currently preoccupied in exploring ways to fast track the trickle down of these measures to customers. To put this economy on a sustainable path, we will need everyone to play its part. Uh, as the two regulators, the Bank of Namibia and Namfisa, will continue to work on our mandates to ensure a conducive environment uh, where both institutions and the consumers of financial services can thrive. Ours is to create a platform where providers and consumers of financial products and services can find each other and do business in a regulated, safe, and a stable environment. The extension of credit to businesses in particular is particularly important for the recovery that we all want to see. It is for this reason that the Bank of Namibia has recently revised the relief measures uh, as well as the SME Economic Recovery Loan Scheme to cater for the larger scope of customers. 
Lending institutions are therefore required to align their lending policies and practices with these revisions. Let me now point out the two things. As I believe we should prioritize as we move forward, we need to sharpen our swords to enhance effective oversight. Abraham Lincoln once said, give me six hours to cut down a tree and I will spend the first four sharpening the ax. To cut our way through these waves of challenges, we need to spend a bit of time sharpening our sword. The world around us is fast changing and this brings not only new opportunities but also new risks. Our two regulatory authorities must therefore do everything possible to remain ahead of the curve. We need to invest in our research capabilities and strengthen the macroprudential surveillance using clear-cut early warning indicators. We need to understand the emerging technologies, do proper risk assessments, and provide a conducive environment where these innovations can thrive. Our regulatory frameworks must not stifle the innovation but embrace these new trends. We must rescue and retool for the future in order to keep up with the fast changing world around us. It is therefore critical to note uh, as technology advances, there will be those that will attempt to take advantage in the digital space by engaging in cyber crimes. We must therefore put adequate defensive mechanisms in place to protect our institutions and systems. I maintain the view that in order for us to ultimately win the war against cyber attackers or hackers and uh, other online criminals, we must create a framework at a national level that allows for the sharing of information across industries and regulators on the prevalence of these activities. I'm therefore happy to report that we've recently launched the Cybersecurity Council in the past year for that very purpose. Thanks to all the stakeholders who made that possible. Secondly, we need to take the public along with us on this journey to recovery. The vital trust of our fellow citizens is a prerequisite to recovery. The need for that trust is even more elevated during times of economic challenges. It is important that our citizens have a clear view of the journey that we have embarked on and the decisions that we take along the way. As authorities, we have an obligation to explain policy decisions that we are taking and how they impact the public at large. Yes, some of the decisions may have a painful impact in the short term, but they, are, they will be necessary for the greater good over the longer term. We therefore need to continue working with critical stakeholders such as the media to disseminate information explaining policy direction and its implications. This goes both ways. The media has a role to play too. Guided by ethics and standards, the media has a moral obligation to report the facts and avoid distortions. I strongly believe that we will be able to overcome the challenges we face, but only if we pull in the same direction. As I conclude, I want to emphasize that the challenges we face are not anything we must shy away from, but something we must face head on. The true measure of a society is not what we do in moments of comfort and convenience, but what we dare do in times of challenges and difficulties. I am therefore confident that we will pull through this if we resolve to do it together. I fur I'm further delighted to note that despite the prevailing risks, uh, thanks to the steps we have already taken, the financial system remains sound and stable. I therefore have the pleasure of declaring the 2023 Financial Stability Report officially launched. I thank you very much. Hey, don't worry about the car, boss. I check nice. Thank you, but it's okay, ne? Even be insurance. Check nicer. Ah. <laughs> no. At FNB Insurance, we provide cover for all your valuables. From your car, to your laptop, to your phone. FNB Insurance. You value it, we cover it. T's and C's apply. Oil is the talk of the town. The Bank of Namibia Governor Johannes Gavahab recently presented at the Energy Conference. Let's have a look. 
The recent oil and gas discoveries come at an opportune time whereby oil revenue, if managed wisely and if proven commercially viable, presents the transformational opportunity to not only shift the country's economic structure and increase foreign reserves, but also transform Namibia into a major player within the regional energy market. However, this will only be possible if the country invests in local workforce development and ensure that it intentionally empowers Namibians to be active participants in the industry rather than be passive spectators. Further to that efforts, we will need to make certain things like diversification of this economy. While oil can provide significant revenue in the short term, it is imperative that the country's economic structure is diversified in order to reduce Namibia's dependence on a single commodity. There are many examples around the world where countries have obtained windfalls from oil and gas, but eventually ended up poorer than before. We must avoid the resource curse at all costs. We must learn from the experiences of others. In my message today, and Selma told me you have got only 10 minutes, and I'm trying to stick to the 10 minutes, I would like to talk about the integrity and governance of our institutions that needs to be strengthened in order to ensure that there is a level playing field for all companies operating industry. Second, I will reflect on the critical measures that need to be in place in order to ensure that Namibia maximizes the benefits of its oil and gas industry. And finally, I will highlight the head start we have made as a country in promoting the equitable distribution of the benefits of Namibia's natural resources through the establishment of the newly launched Sovereign Wealth Fund, the Valvicia Fund. So there's three things, and each one of them will be just two, three minutes. At the Bank of Namibia's 23rd Annual Symposium, we made some key recommendations that we believe will help our country to remain focused. These recommendations included growth-enhancing policies, which is the ma mainly to ensure that the discoveries contribute to sustainable economic growth in the country. Secondly, there was recommendations around investment-related issues which are targeted at broad-based investment that will facilitate the exploitation of the resources to the benefit of the economy. And thirdly, environmental and climate-related recommendations which entail the appropriate management of the government while of the environment while exploiting the resources and assessing the impact from the use of these resources. We are a policy maker and hopefully this is our thinking, if you need to plan as business people, particularly when it comes to the finances in the country. Under the growth enhancing policies, Namibia must aim to do the following. Build competent and accountable institutions. Like many resource rich countries, Namibia needs accountable resource governance institutions to prevent the resource curse. International experience has shown that the resource rich countries tend to be more prone to corruption due to the large rents coupled with weak governance structures. The integrity of our institutions is almost a condition sine qua non, an indispensable action, an essential factor that which Namibia cannot afford to compromise on. As such, the country needs to develop a transparent legal and regulatory framework to govern the industry in order to level the playing field and ensure that there is no corruption or favoritism. As custodians of the oil and gas sector, the Ministry of Mines and Energy must facilitate and ensure that the mechanisms for accountability are in place through responsive legal frameworks and policies. National oil companies are potentially useful instruments, and as such, the National Oil Petroleum Company must be held to the highest accountability and transparency standards and prevent it from becoming a state within a state. These will include the following 
implementing well-functioning legal and regulatory systems, ensuring transparency and accountability for all stakeholders, controlling petroleum revenues and their spending, and developing national competence and capacity for the management of the resources. Secondly, we need to manage the petroleum revenue if we get to that stage. Through assurance of accountability and transparency, the Ministry of Finance and the Revenue Authorities must ensure the collection of due revenues and avoid leakages. Thirdly, we need to maximize local value creation and industrialization. The local content policy published by the Ministry in draft form should specifically aim to maximize the benefits to Namibian citizens. This will be through the enhancement and development of strategies that will target the participation of Namibian labor, goods and services, companies, ownership and financing along the value chain. To this end, the local participation efforts should be clear and concise, and the government's local content policy should aim to address the following. Provide a clear and stable regulatory framework for local content requirements. Identify specific sectors for the development of local capacity. Maximize the employment and development of Namibians. Maximize the participation of local supplies along the value chain. Encourage the transfer of technology, knowledge and skills and promote Namibian ownership and financing at all levels of the sector. Under the investment-related recommendations, the following measure will be, will be required. Targeted incentive packages to reduce the investment risk faced by early adopters in the oil and gas sector and related initiatives. And this may extend to other sectors of strategic importance. This could include a mix of financial incentives, fast-tracking access to land, assistance in meeting of or exceeding legal regulatory provisions, utility connections, and related matters of immediate relevance to lower the barriers of targeted investments. The government should develop a clear energy transition timeline that will boost investor confidence in the country. As a small country that faces the triple challenges of inequality, poverty, and unemployment, Namibia is well within its rights to take advantage of all the resources available in the country. However, as the world continues to move towards decarbonization, the country must develop an energy transition timeline. Regional infrastructure development should be at the forefront of the developmental agenda. Under the environmental and climate recommendations, Namibia will need to ensure that it maintains a high standard of health and safety. We need to protect the environment. Oil production can have a significant impact on the environment and as such, it will be crucial to implement measures that mitigate these impacts. This will be especially true in the Claras region, where efforts will need to be made to control emissions to air, the charges to soil and sea, chemical waste, and ensure the prudent handling of wastewater. Director of Ceremony, ladies and gentlemen, thanks brings me to my concluding remarks regarding Namibia's recently established Sovereign Wealth Fund. In May 2022, Namibia launched the Dalbicha Sovereign Wealth Fund managed by the Bank of Namibia under the auspices of the Ministry of Finance. The creation of the Dalbicha Fund will, without doubt, strengthen Namibia's fiscal stability and resilience to external shocks that stem from Namibia's interconnectedness with the global economy. The Velvicha Fund will facilitate the transfer of wealth sourced from Namibia's abundant natural resources so that generations to come also benefit even long after the current resource base is depleted. With the fund, we are better positioned to institute long-term oil and other natural wealth management. Ladies and gentlemen, in his book, The New Map, Energy, Climate, and the Clash of Nations, Daniel Jerkin states, and I quote him, there is no single energy future. There are multiple possibilities and trajectories with multiple challenges and uncertainties. How we meet them, how we address the energy transition 
will define the 21st century much as oil and gas helped define the 20th century, unquote. The global energy landscape is changing rapidly with new technologies, consumer preferences, and a growing awareness of the environmental impact of fossil fuels, all contributing towards a shift away from traditional oil and gas resources. This shift is creating a new map of global power with countries that are able to adapt to the changing energy landscape set to emerge as the world's new leaders. Ladies and gentlemen, Namibia has the potential to punch well above her weight and size and become an energy exporter. I believe oil and gas will be with us for the next three decades, everybody's guess, but the shift is already happening. As we move forward in crafting the future of Namibia's energy landscape, let us remember that our natural resources are finite, but the benefits they bring can be, are not finite, but the benefits they bring can be. Therefore, we must strive to develop a sustainable and equitable framework that maximizes the benefits to all Namibians both now and in the future. Let us work together towards a prosperous and inclusive Namibia. I thank you for listening. Thank you so much to FMB for this opportunity. much to FNB, what an experience. I never got to do shopping in five minutes, but look at all this.